This year, Mayor Eric Adams and New York City's Department of Education began serving vegan meals for lunch on Fridays to their entire school system, the largest in the United States, serving 1.1 million students and about 1,800 schools to introduce healthier foods. So on one hand, this is wonderful to see, no question. Um, a great way to introduce students to healthier foods, but it, is it enough? Of, of, of course not. And why are they still serving cheese sam sandwiches and cow's milk? What a, what a terrible contradiction. And there's only weak association through their program, through their plan with environmental issues and critical timelines. You know, our students deserve better than that. They need to be told the entire truth, not part of the truth or veiled truth. So about the model or example that New York City and Mayor Adams is following, let's talk about the Go Meat List on Monday campaign. If you do this, assuming you're eating meat on the other days of the week, like most people do, if you do this, if you go meatless on Mondays or Fridays or any other one day of the week, well, you'll be contributing to climate change, pollution, and global depletion of our planet's resources and your own health on only six days of the week instead of seven. You'll be creating a false justification for your actions on the other six days of the week. In other words, please, let's not rest on the laurels of what you're doing right only one seventh of the time. So what does eating less meat really mean or a plant forward diet? It's the same thing. Just in the one hour thus far that I've been speaking here today, just in that one hour, over 9 million animals were slaughtered for us to eat in that one hour. Over, over 114,000 tons of grain were fed to livestock that were raising. But, but during that same one hour, 354 children in the world have died from starvation. Over 3,000 acres of tropical rainforest were destroyed and replaced by cattle and, and over 3 million tons of greenhouse gases have been dumped into our atmosphere by livestock in that one hour. Therefore, I'm advocating a, a much different approach than what the United Nations and others suggest when they state that we should eat less meat or be plant forward. Because with that approach of eating less meat, well, only 8 million animals will be slaughtered in the next hour and only 113,000 tons of grain will be wasted, leaving only 353 children in the world that'll starve to death in that one hour. Isn't that, isn't that what less means? So unlike the Mark Bittman, Michael Pollan, United Nations, and all other eat less meat and plant forward advocates and food gurus, for me, I think these numbers should be zero. I sure do. And it's easily attainable. There's no magic involved. Nothing has to be invented. No new technologies have to be employed. It's simply with what we choose to eat. And then no children will have to die ever again from starvation. And now we're going to take a quick look at this food service section of the policy of sustainability for the entire University of California system. Why? Well, because this is a perfect example of how the efforts of well-intentioned individuals and institutions can be so very far out of alignment with reality because of the definitions they're using. So you tell me, is this, uh, is this sustainable? How about the items I just highlighted in, in orange? Are those sustainable? How about their primary objective at the bottom of 25% by the year 2030? Is, is that sustainable? Who came up with that? In fact, the University of California school system turns to another organization for that definition of sustainable food, which promotes a plant forward menu goal, but it also promotes then any animal product that's marketed by way of humane treatment, grass fed or regenerative agriculture, and the consumption of wildlife caught in our depleted oceans. And it's not much better with campuses on the east side of the United States, is it really? Yale here believes that offering wild caught sea animals is sustainable along with humane raised free range and grass fed animals, all perfectly fine as long as some other organization has placed a label on a dead animal product as being sustainable, then it's okay with Yale. Well, here's a partial list of those companies that Yale sees as sustainable sourcing partners. Uh, Yale even now offers hot dogs and Italian sausages 
made by family owned companies because it's local. Something to be proud of, I suppose. Oh, and Yale is also so scrupulous that they are now partners with Nestle. Yeah, well known as one of the most corrupt corporations in the world, child trafficking, pollution, mislabeling, et cetera. Oh, well documented. Well, I do have a success story here regarding college campuses. This is what Harvard School of Public Health was offering just five years ago in 2017. Normally I'd be repulsed by this, but I'm smiling because <laughs> it's so off, off target. And, and so at that time, when I, when, I asked, when I was asked to give a keynote presentation to the, to the National Association of College and University Dining Directors, um, I took this right off of Harvard's website and I used it as an example of how far off they are and other institutions were off from reality. Well, Harvard's director was in the audience and uh, came up to me afterwards and he let me know uh, that he and their team were pretty embarrassed about this. And I'm happy to say that although I can still find problems with their food sourcing, it's vastly improved from what you see on the screen. So kudos part way to Harvard. So even these highly regarded universities, West Coast, East Coast, and those in between, they would certainly benefit from understanding and then adopting a more accurate view of sustainability and then translating it to their students, our future leaders, and to do it now, today. Otherwise, we continue floating around in a zone that I've always called pseudo-sustainability. That's exactly where we are today, never getting to where we need to be, but thinking that we're sustainable. Well, that's a very dangerous predicament to think you're something and you're really not. And one more very important definition that continues to need refinement, ethics. The ethical consideration of what we choose to eat. The, the topic of conscious eating has always been about animal rights, animal welfare, hasn't it? Yeah, the life and death of other living beings that we consume, how they're treated. Well, ethics has always been about this, but, but I think it's time to view conscious eating or ethics in a much different and a much larger context. And this was all constructed by those family members that you see on the screen here. <laughs> but it needs to be posed in a much different and much larger context. Is it ethical, for instance, for any of us to eat food that causes the extinction of other species if we don't need to? Is it ethical for the vast majority of humans on earth to cause or contribute heavily to irreversible climate change, loss of ecosystems and resource depletion while 2% of us are living our lives by way of food choice to, to protect earth. Is it ethical for any of us to use our planet in a way that exacerbates world hunger and diminishes the potential for future generations to survive? It also then becomes a matter of social justice. The person sitting next to you who's eating a steak, pork, chicken, cheese or fish is taking away the resources that could be spread more evenly, more efficiently and used to support the life of perhaps 20 to 30 other people. Is it even ethical for 325 million Americans to impose their diet related healthcare costs on the 10 million who choose to eat the right foods? So you see, it's time we rethink ethics. It needs to be framed much differently than just with animal rights. In fact, I titled a chapter in, in one of my books, Why Should I Pay for What Everyone Else Decides to Eat? <laughs> Sadly true. Well, it makes little sense to continue doing what our predecessors did in the late 1800s and early 1900s when we didn't know any better. And there were far less mouths to feed with more land and water to do so. Um, do any of you still use a typewriter? or a, a feather quill pen to write a message? How about the Pony Express or the, or the stagecoach to send those messages or, or to travel? And, 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 you th and you thought the internet was slow. <laughs> and what about candles or kerosene lamps to read with at night? Anybody out there still using those to read my books with at night? <laughs> well, well, why not? Why aren't you using these things? I'll tell you why, because they're obsolete. That's why we've outgrown them. They're inefficient. They don't fit. 
And so it is with all meat, dairy, and fish. The world on a global basis can no longer support the production of these things, just like the typewriter, just like the stagecoach. We need to evolve past them, and we need to do it today because the clock is ticking. Almost everything we do, every decision we make every day is based on our culture, what we've learned, what someone else has told us to be acceptable or necessary. After realizing that bloodletting here wasn't so healthy for us after all, we miraculously stopped, even though we've been doing it for more than 3,000 years. There are culturally driven practices we are accepting today, especially with food choices involving all animal products that are much more unhealthy for our planet and for us than bloodletting. And by all accounts, we don't have 3,000 years to get it right. Many organizations are quite concerned about how we're going to feed the growing human population expected to reach 9.8 billion by the year 2050 because demand for food, including meat and dairy, will nearly double what it was just a couple of years ago. Looking at the future, we have some troubling trends. We'll likely see increased numbers and wealth of the middle class and an associated increase in demand for animal products, which will come at the expense of developing countries that have the most land and resources. Meat consumption will, will rise astronomically in developing countries over the next 25 years, which will bring with it the predicted increase in Western diseases such as heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and furthering hunger and poverty. Much of that we talked about on Saturday. Eventually the wealth of any nation will be redefined in terms of natural resources and the strength of its sustainable systems. Our survival will depend on how quickly and accurately we begin to define this word sustainable. We're gonna see sustainability become a growth opportunity and a risk management strategy for businesses, essentially transforming economics. Futurists ask, ask each other, <laughs> what one new idea will, will change the world drastically in the next century? Where, well, will it be new nanotechnology, transhumanism and robotics? Hey, hey, how about human colonization in space? Yeah, that sounds exciting. But in terms of ensuring our existence in a thriving world where all, all species are living in harmony and healthy, that one transforming idea that futurists are asking about is for all humans on earth to eat only plant-based food. Mm -hmm.